Hello and welcome. This is Tony Curzon Price with another Open Democracy Tedworth podcast. This is part three of my conversation with Dr. Dr. Georgios Varouksakis on his latest book, Liberty Abroad John Stuart Mill on International Relations. In this podcast, we will talk about Mill's views of nationalism, his views of tribalism, his celebration of cultural hybridization and his views on when foreign intervention is justified. Let's now talk about the the nations of Europe. So in 1848, he's a great supporter of the spring of the nations, of the national revolutions. Uh, He thinks that these are going to be, are going to go towards, uh, uh, are going to be liberogenic. Yes, in general, he was in favor of any national liberation movements but he got very worried after 1848 after how these movements manifested themselves so I I have found him being worried about nationality which he was supporting the principle of nationality and the creation of nation states um, exactly on the grounds that we were discussing earlier that um, otherwise they would be played off each national the different nationalities would be played off by the central government and that central government would go on existing and being despotic, like in the Austrian case, by playing them off against each other. And the experiences of 1848 proved that, he thought. That's what he and many others thought, although some historians, of course, may disagree uh, as to what exactly happened. But then Mill was very, very scared by what, uh, and disgusted by how nationalism was manifesting itself, what we would today call tribalism how people would treat uh, horribly other people who didn't speak their language or weren't supposed to be of the same race, how their only consideration was national um, loyalty and national affinity or ethnic affinity as opposed to any common cause for liberty, rights and so on. So there is a very discernible uh, change of tone. He changes a text where he was praising nationality as a factor in... uh, Reinfor- that reinforced solidarity and cohesion in society to a principle of cohesion among the members of the same community or state, which is a much different thing. It's, it's and a kind where, of where does civic patriotism. Where might that person. come from if it's not nationality? Loyalty to the state, loyalty to the institutions of the state. So he, in, in that statement, you clearly have a statement of uh, cit- citizenship, of, of loyalty to the institutions of a, of a state worth loving. But he wasn't he was realistic. He knew that nationality is there to stay. So he thought wherever possible you should accommodate it and have states which are homogeneous. But he, in the famous chapter on nationality, where which is endlessly quoted and uh, uh, misquoted, I find sometimes, um, he spent most of the chapter explaining why most of the time this solution is not possible. The solution, one state, one nation, is not possible because the populations are so intermingled in Central and Eastern Europe that they have to make a virtue of necessity and live together, he says. And then there are other factors, uh, more important, where he says the mixture of nationalities leads to better results, leads to m- uh, better cultures. So the moral... Um, um, the, he has this argument that the, the outcome of, a, of, a, of crossbreeding, uh, not just of you know, ethnic groups, but of cultures, is always leads to better results. It always leads to a, a higher culture. So it's in the interest of civilization and everybody that people should mix and live together, and not 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 in the sense that some of them should disappear, but in the in a sense of give and take, in a, in a sense of heterosis. And by the way, that's that was his uh, ideal in terms of these islands that Celts and Anglo-Saxons, English and Irish, English and Scots. He was the son of a Scottish man and an English mother himself. Welsh and English and so on should all give and take and create um, and that that, that that creates a, a richer culture as opposed to anybody disappearing completely and assimilating in somebody else's culture. Uh, he opens liberty with this quote from von Humboldt, doesn't he? The the grand leading principle is the absolute and essential importance of human development in its richest diversity. Yes, yes. And this is this is the, the, the this in the end is the basis for his defense of liberty it is the development it's human development in its richest diversity yes yes uh this this question of his attitude towards the nations leads on to this question of of his attitude towards intervention so you really 
focus on three cases of intervention in the book. There's, there's, there's Hungary and what Britain should have done in the Hungarian case. There's Alsace-Lorraine and there's Italy. He, yes. he, takes, he takes different views in each of those cases, extremely particular views yes. on what constitutes, what should, what an intervention should be and what constitutes a ground for intervention. Yes, alas, like today, intervention and non-intervention was an, a nightmarish um, uh, question because it's so complicated. So I hope I explain what is what in the book and we can go through the whole chapter and all the different cases and how complicated the Italian question was, for example, because, but to, to, to put it simply, Non-intervention in international law and in international custom of the time meant that you do not interfere in the internal affairs of a recognized state. But then that means you do not interfere in the internal affairs of the kingdom of two Sicilies, the, the king of Naples, who was, he was famously called Bomba, who was horrible to his own subjects and so on. Mill turned the tables without being too explicit about it and, and talked about the Italian case more or less as if everybody should respect the self-determination of the Italian nation as a whole to sort its own affairs alone and to unify if they, if, if they so wish, without Austria and other foreign powers, uh, including Napoleon III, who was trying to help the Italians in order to get his own gains, and that was complicating matters for the British. Uh, so the Italian question was not in, in, in unbelievably complicated, but my conclusion, and I think I make it explicit in the end, is that he was trying to be careful how, how he was using a term that had a certain meaning in his time and changing the meaning. So, 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 so explain that. He, his view is that, or what he comes to defend is that um, uh, intervention, that non-intervention requires intervention if the peoples are being intervened with already. Oh yeah, that, yes, that's the, that's, the, the, that's the straightforward part. The straightforward part is okay. What is behind the lines is that Mill went beyond that and he thought that, um, he, he thought that in some cases you just have to um, support liberation struggles, full stop. When it was straightforward, yes, exactly. Uh, but the official line, the, if you asked him what is your official line, what is your explicit theory, it was the famous theory of counter-intervention to enforce, enforce non-intervention. So in the case, the case of Hungary was straightforward for him because here were the Hungarians having rebelled against the um, uh, Austrian Empire, the Habsburg Empire, Having prevailed and being very likely to create an independent state um, as things were on the ground, and the Austrians called for help their fellow autocratic um, emperor of Russia, the Tsar, and the Russian troops come and help the Austrians to subjugate the uh, Hungarians. Their meal makes those um, very uh, vociferous and straightforward and powerful statements that are quoted in the book that Britain should have said this this will not be this should not be you cannot just uh, interfere in another country's rebellion where the rebels have already prevailed and suppress them to, to help another despot the liberal powers the free powers should have said if the wrong sides help the wrong side then we will help the right side and even if britain could not do it in terms of how you do it on the ground britain and france together he said we could have done it and if they had done it and remember, France was then a republic. It was not uh, a yet a despotism that Mill didn't want to have anything to do with. In 1849 that this happened, Britain could have um, easily, he thought, uh, said together with France, made a declaration, we are going to interfere to protect uh, self-determination for the Hungarians if the, Ru the Russians should go out. And Mill's argument is uh, they didn't do it, and what did they gain? They had to fight Russia a few years later uh, in the in the um, Crimean War without Hungary as an ally because Hungary didn't exist, it had been suppressed. Whereas an independent Hungary would be, of, of course, a loyal ally of the liberal powers. Uh, and that was one of his considerations, actually. Wherever you can support s new states, nation states that would be liberal, um, you are better off in the struggle against the despots uh, to the extent that there was likely to be a struggle sooner or later. So I, I know that you resist the temptation to do this, and you resist it admirably in the book. And in fact, you take Mike Waltz uh, to task 
for uh, trying to bring Mill into his uh, uh, anti-Vietnam book, war anti-Vietnam book, war book. Yes. marvelous um, book by the way <laughs> uh, yeah uh, just just an unjust, just wars. An unjust wars yes very 1977 uh, yeah yeah striking book um but one can't read this with this chapter on intervention without thinking of Syria yes and thinking well what does this view of the world mean for a complicated problem, a problem that's been created by all sorts of things which one feels that Mill would be absolutely appalled by, like yes. the creation of the Syrian state as a state in the first place yes. uh, uh, after the First World War. How, how yes. do you well, see... I fear you would ask this question, and I, I'm not sure I have an answer. I, have to, I'll have, I didn't think about it because I was hoping you wouldn't ask it. Uh, I'll think aloud. Um, well, first of all, he would... You could apply the theory of counter-intervention to enforcement intervention. So one argument would Im immediately be, but there is already a lot of intervention there. That's the problem. So if it was simply a civil war between um, warring factions or parties within Syria, prima facie Mill would have said, um, well, perhaps you should let them decide. He's quite brutal about that, isn't he? You quote him, I can't remember the context, but you quote him as saying that actually the best test of whether a, a people is ready... Liberty enough ...is if they are ready to fight for it. But there is so much intervention already. He would, he would be the first to say here the, 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 the Russians are intervening and arming the government. There are all sorts of... The Saudis, uh, the, the yes, Iranians... The Turks. So there is so much intervention that... Um, you would have to decide who has interfered where and make up your mind what you do. He would probably think that at th by this stage um, the problem is not that. The problem is humanitarian intervention. He, he's very clear and Michael Walter plays that uh, he, he says Mill doesn't discuss humanitarian intervention. He doesn't in the sense he doesn't use the word but he, he gives three examples of intervention that sounds exactly like humanitarian intervention where either uh, the whole international community or the neighbors, either the great powers or the neighbors, or anybody who has the will to do it, a great power, that, a liberal great power that has the will, you are entitled to interfere if there is a protracted civil war that leads nowhere, that leads to endless fight, fighting and killing, and it's a stalemate, which is now official. The, the, the foreign minister, of, um, I think, of Assad said it's a stalemate. Yes. Nobody's going to win. Mill would say you, you are entitled to go and, 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 and try to force them with some terms of compromise to stop the killing. Now, when it comes to illegal war, war, weapons that have been proscribed through international treaties being used, then it, it adds to the argument that you could do some, you have to do something if you can, because of of, uh, of a violation of international law. So, 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 so we, we have those two cases. We have the violation of international law. We have the responsibility to protect. But let's stick for a moment on this question of intervening in order to uh, neutralize other interventions. Surely the case of Syria shows how theoretical and mythical such a notion is. Because no one in the context today imagined that Britain and the United States intervened and that their argument was that we are countering the interventions of uh, Russia and various Gulf states. Th there's no sense in which anyone, any party in the world, would consider this to be a neutralization. Yes, exactly. Because there has been so much intervention already, uh, starting from the creation of these states, as you say. So the history... Uh, in the last few decades is, in, in that part of the world is so complicated with claims and counterclaims that obviously Mill, if he was around, he would give us a more complex or sophisticated theory than he did back then. Um, what I think remains from his argument, what I think is valid, what we need to remember from what he argued, and he would be the first to say that he has no, uh, I say that in the conclusion to the book actually, that he has no straightforward uh, theory that fits all the cases, that he just has principles, and that you have to have a hierarchy of principles, which one takes precedence, when, why. Uh, the thing that I think is still valid and important is Mill would be acharnement, Mill would be vociferously and, uh, and, and uh, fanatically against spreading democracy by the sword, against uh, spreading a good constitution just because you can to people who have not themselves fought for it. 
you, he thinks he thought you, you should go there and help them if they are being swamped by some other foreign country that is about to suppress a liberal rebellion in a country. But going there to spread democracy or to spread freedom, imposing freedom by the sword is a contradiction in terms, he says, because as soon as you go, it will collapse. If people have to have sufficient love for their democracy, for their freedom, for their liberties to fight for it in order for, for it to, to be viable. What complicates matters, and he knew that, and today we know that even more, is how many other people intervene on either side meanwhile. So if there was no intervention, this argument would be interesting. But you see, I think, what I'm trying to say. He would be against regime change and nation building um, just because we want to spread democracy, because that's, that's, that's a contradiction in terms. Democracy has to be among people who want to have democracy, and liberty has to be enjoyed by people who want to fight. So he thinks, he thought you should go and help them if somebody prevents them from having what they are already entitled to through their own struggles. And there you counter intervene. But to just go and decide, I'm going to give you a better constitution, he thought you shouldn't do that. Georgios, Does uh, that make some sense? It certainly makes sense. And it takes us, I think, to the, to the point which is very striking in this book is how many of these issues that confronted uh, England at the time and that Mill thought uh, thought about as practical problems are have echoes in the modern day. They're not echoes that you as a scholar of Mill uh, want, to, want to follow through, but the reader of this book is going to be utterly struck by the um, uh, by the continuing importance of the questions that he poses and by the subtlety of the uh, the subtlety the particularity of the answers that he gives i commend the uh, the book to everyone it has uh, chapters on m many more things than we've discussed there's there's uh, uh, immigration there's emigration there's some wonderful war stuff on peace. on there's war and peace there's militias international uh, law international law international uh, absolutely i i, I was uh, uh, I, I love the the argument for the swiss style swiss style militia uh, instead of instead of a volunteer army um, there's 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 a huge amount of material in this book uh, and it shows the sheer uh, uh, breadth and subtlety of the man's thinking george thank you very much thank you thank you Tony.